Amen. Deuteronomy chapter 17. Interesting chapter in the Bible here. So at the end, especially the last half towards the end of Deuteronomy chapter 17, it's interesting because the Bible, God starts kind of prophesying what's going to happen and what the children of Israel are actually going to ask for once they get into the promised land. Keep in mind, this is before even the book of Judges has happened. You know, remember the book of, we had the judges that come and they rule over the children of Israel and they, you know, judge the land. You know, you have Samson and all the different judges of the Bible. And then, you know, Samuel, the last judge, basically, you know, after Samuel, they decide that they want a king. They want a king just like all these other nations around them, right? And, I mean, is that a good thing? Does God, did God encourage the children of Israel when they went into the Promised Land to, you know, mimic the ways that those other nations were doing things? No, they were supposed to completely wipe them out. They were supposed to not um, adopt any of their culture at all, right? So here in Deuteronomy chapter 17, it's very interesting that God is basically tell them, telling them, you know, a mistake that they're going to make and a road that they're going to go down that's against what he told them to do. And the, the thing that he does is, you know, this shows the mercy of God, by the way. So what he does is he says, hey, you guys are going to ask for a king just like those other nations, which is basically against what I've told you to do. But since you're going to do that, here's some advice on what that king should be like, what you should look for in a king. So, I mean, God is just like ever merciful to the children of Israel, and it shows his mercy. You know, I mean, we can see that mercy today. You know, we'll get into that um, a little bit further into the sermon. But basically this sermon, um, I had to just like stop writing it because it was just like, it was going to be like five hours long. Okay, so there's just too much here. But basically, I want to start out by saying that Deuteronomy chapter 17 is giving advice to kings. Okay? And you say, what does that have to do with me? Turn to Revelation chapter 1. Turn to Revelation chapter 1. So God is giving advice to kings in Deuteronomy chapter 17. Turn to Revelation chapter 1. You're saying, what does that have to do with me? So he tells the kings to do all this stuff, and you know, so what? I'm not a king from the Old Testament. Turn to Revelation chapter 1, look at verse number 4. The Bible says, John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Grace be unto you, and peace from him which is, and which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. And from, so here's John writing this letter, right? And he's saying this is from John, but then in, in verse number five, he says, really, it, who's it from? It's from Jesus Christ, okay? Who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth. There's the kings. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. So who is us? Us is the people that have had their sins washed from them in the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right? And then he says, and hath made us, there's the same us, hath made us kings and priests Amen. unto God his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. Again in Revelation chapter 5 and verse number 10, we hear this same language. And hath made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Well, you say, okay, well, he's just talking about the end times, because that's revelation, right? I mean, it's just end time stuff. I mean, I'm not a king and a priest. I mean, this is just end time stuff. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. I'm not going to let you off the hook here. 1 Peter chapter 2, look at verse number 5. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up. That means to bring offering, by the way, to offer something, okay? Spiritual sacrifices. You're not to offer like lambs and goats and all those things, but these spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Look at verse number nine of the same chapter. But ye are a chosen generation. He's talking to saved people here, okay? A royal priesthood. Well, doesn't that make sense? If you're kings and priests, you're a royal priesthood, folks. Amen. And holy nation, a peculiar people. Look, that's, that, that's evidence that you should be separated. Right. People are going to think you're peculiar. That's different. That's strange. That's not the same as everybody else. Right. That you should show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1. So look, 
You're a royal priesthood. So you are kings and priests if you're saved. If you're saved, you're a king and a priest. You're a royal priesthood. You say, okay, but why? To, to what end? I mean, why would this language be used to describe me a saved Christian today? Look at 2 Timothy chapter 1. Look at what the Bible says in verse number 8. He says, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. What is the testimony of our Lord? Well, if we keep reading, it tells us. Okay, Be thou therefore not ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, talking about Paul, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of, then he defines what the testimony of our Lord is, afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us, here it is again, with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. So, look, if you're saved, it's because you were, you know, you were called with an holy calling. All right? Now, look, this isn't... Don't, don't get me wrong. Everybody is called to be saved. Amen. God wants everybody to be saved. It's just, look, very few people pick up the phone. Right. All right? Think about it that way. All right? But we're called to be saved, but also there's a purpose here. There's a purpose for us here. Turn to John chapter 15. We're getting closer. So you know that you're a king and a priest. You're a royal priesthood. And you have this purpose. You have this purpose for you. So what is the purpose? You say, okay, I see that we're kings and I see that we're priests, but, but for what, to what end? Look at verse number 16 of John 15. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you. There's your priesthood right there. That ye should go, they should do what? That you should go and bring forth fruit. And that your fruit should remain. That whosoever ye shall ask, of, whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he shall give it to you. So look, your uh, royal priesthood that I'm looking at here today. And you have one mission, your main mission, your main purpose is to bring forth fruit in this life. That is why that this is such a, it's the number one emphasis, emphasis of this ministry, is to bring forth fruit. Because you're a royal priesthood. You've been ordained as a saved believer to bring forth fruit. That, that's why there's such a heavy emphasis on it, because it's the emphasis. It's the point. For the purpose of preaching the gospel to a lost world. All that to say this. This spiritual advice to kings in Deuteronomy chapter 17, it applies to you. All that to say that. So look, here in Deuteronomy chapter 17, we see advice for kings. Look at verse number 18. And it shall be, when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write him a copy of the law in the book, in a book out of that which is before the priests and the Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life. So he's supposed to go and get a copy of the law from the priests. He's supposed to write out a copy, and he's supposed to read it all the days of his life. Look, that means he's supposed to read it every day. It doesn't say, you know, every month or every year he's supposed to glance at it. He's supposed to read the law. So it gives things specifically in Deuteronomy chapter 17 that will happen if he reads the law. It gives reasons for it. And, it, you know, then we can infer from there the things that will happen if he doesn't read the law. So this morning, since you're kings and priests, and we see advice to kings and priests here, we're going to talk about the importance of reading your Bible. And that is why, I mean, there is so much on this in the Bible that I just had to click save and print at some point. Because there, it's, just, it's just too much. There's too much importance on reading the Bible. So the first thing, the first thing, let me just give you a few points and then we'll, we'll apply that to your lives this morning. But the first point and the first major reason that a king needs 
to read the law or the Bible is this. Turn to 1 Kings chapter 3. 1 Kings chapter 3. Something that you will need as a king, as a matter of fact, it's so important that when God said to Solomon, what do you want? It's the one thing that he asked for. And you say, what is it? And it is this. It's judgment. It's judgment. You say, this doesn't sound good. Well, just let's get into what the Bible says. Look at 1 Kings chapter 3 and verse number 5. This is the first time that God has appeared to Solomon, right here. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give thee. What would you ask for if God literally appeared to you and asked you what you know, he should give you? He's like, I'll give you anything. What would you like? Look at verse number 9. Solomon goes on, and then in verse number 9, he gets to what he wants, and he says, Give thy therefore, give therefore thy servant an understanding heart. Why? To judge the people, that I may discern between good and bad, for who is able to judge this thy so great a people? And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing, and God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and not asked for thyself a long life, neither asked for riches for thyself, nor asked for the life of thine enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. So here, first of all, here's a young man less than 20 years old and he asked for this so that's impressive in itself okay so look but he asked for judgment he asked for you know discernment in judgment to judge the people properly so you know the question that we ask ourselves and so many different people ask themselves today is should we be judgmental i mean what does it mean to judge first of all the, the secular definition means this, to form an opinion or a conclusion about. But guess what? The Bible defines it in 1 Kings chapter 3 and verse number 9. Give thy, therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge the people. And then here's your, really your definition right here. Why? So he wants an understanding heart. So it takes, it takes an understanding heart to judge. Okay? So that's, that's what you need. That's the tools. Like I need a wrench to take a bolt out. Right? I need an understanding heart and able to judge. But what is judging? To judge thy people. That I may what? Discern between good and bad. That's it. That's the definition of judgment right there. Judgment is, dis I mean, judgment is discerning between good and bad. I mean, it's one of the stupidest doctrines of fake Christianity today. Yeah. That you are not to judge. You are not to discern between good and bad. I mean, what in the world? I mean, even the secular definition, to come to a conclusion about something. I'm never to, I'm to live a life where I never come to a conclusion about anything? Are, are you serious? I mean, who are these people? Who are, I mean, who, who's sitting in these churches? That's what I want to know. I mean, what's the point? I mean, imagine, imagine a guy at work, even in the simplest job, that just can't come to a conclusion about anything. <laughs> I mean, I think some of you guys are laughing because you met this guy. Look, imagine me at work. One engineer comes to, comes to a conclusion of 12, and the other engineer comes to a conclusion of 120. And I'm just like, well, you know, I think you're both right. <laughs> and let's, hey, let's compromise, and let's just call it 66. Because if you add 12 and 120 and you divide by 2, you get 66. We'll take the average. Are you happy? Are you happy? All right. And then the building falls down and everybody dies. Look, somebody missed a decimal point. Happens all the time. Somebody was right. Somebody was wrong. And it takes someone with some understanding to figure out the good from the bad. I mean, does this not make sense? I mean, what's happening today, right? I mean, look, there's some times where somebody is mistaken. Maybe there's times when somebody is lying. I mean, we're all liars, right? I mean, what's the one sin we use out soul winning that everybody has, like, no problem admitting that they've done? Lying. So how do you tell when someone's lying? Like, look, 
there is almost nothing worse than a leader who can't make a decision. And I've said this many times, like, look, sometimes any decision is better than no decision at all. And that is very true. I mean, just think of like, you know, a power plant that needs a new pump or a new motor or something. And the mechanics, they come to the, the boss and they're like, hey, boss, you know, we could either rebuild this pump or motor or, or we could buy a new one. What do you think? And then he's like, well, you know, let me think about it for a month. And then the power plant explodes, right? I mean, any decision in that case would be better than no decision. So this idea of no judgment is the dumbest thing. It, it, it takes like five seconds of logical linear thinking to prove it false. Solomon even knew this. Are you still in 1 Kings chapter 3? He knew this, and look, it was his, not only is his, was it his number one concern as being king, but he used it right away. Look at 1 Kings chapter 3, same chapter. Look at verse 16. Solomon, as soon as he asks for this, he's put in a terrible situation where someone's life is literally on the line here. A human being's life is on the line. Look at 1 Kings chapter 3 and verse number 16. So he asked for a discerning heart. He's like, God, I need to know how to judge properly. Look at 1 Kings 3 and, and verse number 16. There came two, then there came two women that were harlots unto the king and stood before him. And the one said, O oh my Lord, I and this woman dwell in one house, and I was delivered of a child with her in the house. And it came to pass the third day that after I was delivered, that this woman was delivered also, and they were together, and there was no stranger with us in the house, save we two. So look, these two women, they had babies just days apart from each other. Okay, and it, there was nobody else to witness this, just these two ladies. And this lady says, and this woman's child died in the night because she overlaid it. So one of the ladies like rolls over at night and like accidentally suffocates her child. Terrible story. And she rose at midnight and took my son from beside me while thine handmaid slept and laid it in her bosom and laid her dead child in my bosom. So here this lady that accidentally killed her child, she switches with the other baby and takes the other lady's baby. And when I arose in the morning to give my child suck, behold, it was dead. But when I had considered it in the morning, behold, it was not my son. First of all, I mean, a, a mom knows her baby, right? I mean, a mom knows her baby by the smell of the baby, by the look of the baby, by the sound of the baby, right? I was always amazed by the sheep, and we would have hundreds and hundreds of lambs everywhere. And whenever the moms were separated from feeding or whatever their lambs, lambs would get together and run around like a bunch of little kids for about 10 minutes, and then the moms would all go out in the lambs. They all looked the same to me. And the moms would just make a sound, and the lamb would make a sound, and within five minutes, they all had their own baby back. So this lady knew who her baby was, right? Like, it, it's hardwired. And the other woman said, Nay, but the living is my son, and the dead is thy son. And this said, No, but the dead is thy son, and the living is thy son. So they're arguing. Thus they spake before the king. So, I mean, how is the king to know? Who's lying here? Then said the king, The one saith, This is my son that liveth, and thy son is the dead. And the other saith, Nay, but thy son is dead, and my son is the living. And the king said, Bring me a sword. And they brought a sword before the king. And the king said, Divide the living child in two, and give half to the one, and half to the other. Then spake the woman whose living child was unto the king, for her bowels yearned upon her son. And she said, O oh, my Lord, give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. But the other said, Let it be neither mine nor thine, but divide it. Then the king answered and said, Give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. She is the mother thereof. That's brilliant right there. Amen. So he says, Just cut the child in half, kill the child, basically. And right away, and I'm sure Solomon, even, even though the other lady totally gave it away by saying, Yeah, just kill the child. Look, the first one to pipe up here, is the mom. Can, can you imagine? I mean, you ought to be able to just have those two ladies sitting there and the king, who, by the way, the king can do whatever he wants. If he says divide the child, the child will get divided. The king can do whatever he wants. And when he, and when he lays that judgment forth, I'm sure just on, before she even said anything, he knew by the look on that mother's fa face. So look, he had to judge. Okay, first of all, he, he he had to judge properly. But look, he had to judge. Or someone's life. I mean, someone would have lost their child. 
I mean, evil would have prevailed. A child would have been kidnapped if he didn't judge. I mean, think about it. So to believe that you should never judge is to believe the idea that there's no right and wrong. That's what it means. I mean, how could evil ever be recognized? Turn to Romans 13. Or, I mean, it couldn't be recognized or it couldn't be punished. Evil couldn't be punished if no one ever judged. Look at Romans 13 and verse number 3. I mean, the Bible says that even secular government, even government, this is their main job right here, to judge. Look at Romans 13 and verse 3. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. So the whole point of rulers, the whole point of good government is to be a terror to the evil, not the good. And to understand, to discern the good from the evil, you have to judge. That's the main or God-ordained responsibility of rulers is to punish evil. So look, when these idiot new evangelicals or whatever you call them say, you know, don't ever judge, you know what they're advocating? They're advocating anarchy. Right. They're advocating chaos is what they're advocating. You know what? That's what they're getting out there. They're advocating it and they're getting it. Because no one will stand up against evil anymore. Because they all go to church, oh, don't judge, everything's right. No, it is not right. We are to judge righteous judgment. Turn to John chapter 7. And look, there are times in your life where you will need to judge. And as a king and priest, you will need to judge. John 7, 24 says, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. You say, okay, great. All that to say this. You say, okay, great. We're to judge righteous judgment. But God gave, God gave Solomon all that wisdom. He just gave it to him, right? Which is true. God said, you're just going to get more wisdom than anyone that's ever lived. You're going to have it right now. But how am I supposed to get that? Well, turn to Hebrews 5. I'm glad you asked. Turn to Hebrews 5. So in Hebrews 5, Paul is chastising believers a little bit here. He's kind of, you know, has some harsh words for some believers. In Hebrews 5, look at verse number 12. But we get an idea of what we need to do to get this discerning heart so we can judge properly. Because look, here's something you don't want to do. You don't want to be this person that goes around making the wrong decision all the time. All right? You don't want to be this person that goes around just judging wrong all the time. All right? That'll be disastrous as well. Look at Hebrews chapter 5 and verse number 12. The Bible says, For when... For when for the, when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again. He's like, you're supposed to be teachers, and here I am going over the same stuff with you again that I've already got. I mean, he's a little frustrated. Can you, can you hear it in his voice? Which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not strong meat. So he's saying, he's comparing these first principles, you know, the simple things, the main things of the Bible to milk and not strong meat. Look at verse 13. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the, here we see, he calls it the oracles of God, and now he calls it the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of, their, of use have their senses exercised to what? discern both good and evil. So he's talking about reading the oracles of God, reading the word of righteousness. He's talking about reading the Bible here. He's talking about reading the word of God. He's like, hey, when you do it by reason of use, he's like, when you actually use it, you will be able to discern good and evil. So you want to be like Solomon and have that wise judgment? You better know what the Bible says. That's what Paul is saying. And so he's going back and he's visiting, you know, a bunch of people and they just like have forgotten or they're not, you know, remembering, you know, even the simple things of the Bible. And he's like, look, how are you going to ever learn to discern, you know, good and evil if you never actually use, if you never actually read the words of God, if you never actually read the oracles of God. So look, God is telling the kings in Deuteronomy chapter 7 that reading his word will allow them to do this effectively. Otherwise, you know, judgment will be perverted by this king that doesn't know what the law says. 
So, you know, you don't want to judge situations incorrectly. You could do a lot of damage to people, especially if you're a king or a priest. I mean, have you ever wondered, you know, how, how a good pastor just seems to know, you know, what to do in certain situations? You ever, have you ever wondered that? I mean, they just seem to know. I mean, that's why, look, that's why people ask counsel of their pastor. A good pastor should know what to do in situations when you're like, when you've taken your life and you've made it this horrible, twisted up mess, and you're like, look what I've done. And the pastor is like, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to peel this one back. We're going to take this string around here. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And he unravels the mess for you. How did he know how to do it? Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. How did he know how to do that? 1 Timothy chapter 3, look at verse number 6. Talking about the qualifications of a pastor. Look, there's a lot of bad pastors out there that call themselves pastors. There's a lot of bad people out there that have, you know, decided to be a pastor of some group of people and are leading people astray. See Jeremiah 23. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 3. The Bible says the very first thing here in this verse, it says, not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. If you've ever wondered how a pastor can do that, a good pastor, a qualified pastor, it's because he is required to know the Word of God. He is required to have serious command of the Bible. Serious command. And then, and only then, will he have sound judgment. Will he have that ability to know what to do and know how to unravel your ball that you've created. Or, you know, he could judge situations incorrectly. I bet there's a lot of people out there that have gotten divorced because some spiritual leader told them that it was okay to get divorced. I mean, that's just one example. I mean, you could really, I mean, you should never want to be a pastor, never want to go into any kind of position like that unless you have command of the Bible. Because you could, you could wreck a lot of stuff. So first of all, it's to get judgment so they can judge and discern good from evil. Second of all, go back to Deuteronomy chapter 17. Deuteronomy chapter 17. Deuteronomy chapter 17, look at verse number 20. So there's another reason. There's another reason that the Bible says that this king should read God's word and that he should read it every day. And look at the first part of verse 20. It says that his heart be not lifted up amongst, above his brethren. Look, folks, a major theme in the Bible is humility. And the Bible says that if you read the Word of God, it will keep you humble. Why? Well, turn to Philippians chapter 2 for a couple different reasons. But the first one is this, just simply by command. Just by command. I mean, humility is one of the major themes of the entire Bible, to be humble. Look at Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 3. We could read verses on humility for the next hour. No problem. Look at Philippians chapter 2. Look at verse number 3. The Bible says, Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem other better than, himself, than themselves. Look, we are not to be lifted up. Turn to Colossians chapter 3 while I read for you Luke chapter 14, verse number 11. It says, For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. So the Bible is teaching us to be humble. Look at Colossians 3, verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, and long-suffering. James 4.10 says, Humble yourself in the sight of God, and He shall lift you up. So the Bible teaches again and again and again as a main theme that we need to be humble. So first of all, if you're reading that, and you're, I mean, look, if you're not getting that, you're not reading the Bible because it's everywhere in the Bible. And the second reason is this. By seeing men and women greater than us fall, we are taught to be humble through the Word of God. By example, I mean, think about it, from Saul to Hezekiah, to pretty much all the kings. Like, everyone missed this one. 
Basically, all the kings, you know, men and women greater than us, that many of them had greater resources than us, you know, have fallen hard. And when we read the Bible, we see that. And it's humbling. Turn to Proverbs chapter 16. That should keep us humble. That should make us realize that, you know what? If it can happen to King David, I should be humble. If it can happen to somebody that was in such high standing with God, that had such a perfect heart towards God, maybe I should watch myself. Maybe I'm not just safe from ever falling. Look at Proverbs 16 and verse 18. The Bible says this about the opposite of humility. It says, Pride goeth before destruction, and an haughty spirit before a fall. Look, the opposite of humility is pride. And pride, the Bible says, will literally destroy you. Right. It says, look, it says destruction. I mean, that's rough. I mean, it's kind of nice because, look, pride, at least, at least pride goeth before destruction, right? So there's another reason to come to church right here. Because the problem with pride is this. A lot of times, pride won't show up when you look in the mirror. It's always nice to have brothers and sisters in Christ, friends that will wound you. Look, I'd rather be wounded than be destroyed. So it's nice to surround yourself with real friends. They're not just, you know, your friends to just be in sin with you, to just validate your sin. It's nice to have friends that will wound you before you destroy yourself. So, I mean, I'm thankful for that, that it's before destruction. I'm thankful that it's not, hey, pride is at the same time as destruction. As soon as you get pride done, I'm glad that it goes before it so you can, some, at least somebody can recognize it. Maybe, maybe wound you and stop you from destroying yourself. So it keeps you humble. If you read the Bible, you will be humble. That's why he tells the king to read the Bible every day. Second of all, and here's an important one, especially you know, if you want to grow up and have a family and have kids or whatever, but he tells them, that reading the Bible, reading the law, is important for prolonging your kingdom. You want to prolong your kingdom? Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 17. It's not only for proper judgment, it's not only for humility, but it's to teach the next generation. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 17 and verse number 20. That his heart not be not lifted up among, above his brethren, that he turn not aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, to the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom. So, you know, prolong your kingdom personally. Hey, there's something in it for you personally. He and his children in the midst of Israel. So, look, it'll, it'll protect your kingdom. I mean, think about it. I mean, it'll protect your family, it'll protect the next generation against perversions of the law, against heresy. I mean, I mean, think about lawyers, you know, arguing a case against each other. I mean, who is going to be better? I mean, think of one lawyer arguing and he just doesn't even know what the law is. I mean, how's that going to go? Whoever, whoever has better command of the law has a much better chance of prevailing. I mean, Knowing the law will help you protect the gospel on earth. Well, you say, but what? We have the right gospel here. How many people have the right gospel? Like nobody. How many churches, if we were to add up all the churches, and even just Fresno, how many of them, if we said correct gospel and not correct gospel, where would the majority of churches be? It wouldn't even be close. It wouldn't even be close. Knowing the law will help protect the gospel. And look, for future generations, it needs to be protected. It's Amen. our job as kings and what? Priests. Amen. To protect the gospel. Your knowledge of the Bible will have generational effects. Your knowledge of the Bible will have generational effects. You say, how is that possible? Because the Bible tells you. Amen. Period. I mean, I could preach a whole sermon series on that one thing, but for, for today, just for sake of time, because the Bible tells you that it will. 
It says it will prolong you and your children's generation and their kingdom in the midst of Israel. So look, there's some serious points there for these kings to be reading the Bible every single day. But look, let's just, let me just wrap this up for you and just say this. The lack of knowledge of the Bible today in general is shocking. And I can see it personally over the last few years even getting worse. Look, nobody has a feel or their finger on the pulse of a population like a soul winner does. Nobody. Because you're out there, you're literally talking to the people. You're literally talking to the general population. And look, most people, not only can they not quote anything from the Bible, most people have forgotten the main themes of the Bible. They don't even know what they are. This is the reason, folks, that we have the issues that we have in our country today. I mean, at least throughout the majority of our history, you know, people had a general knowledge of the Bible. You know, I mean, say what you want about, you know, the founding fathers. You know, some were saved, some were unsaved, but they all had respect and some sort of command of what the Bible said. Pretty much every single one of them. They all, I mean, they all had respect for it. I mean, even the unsaved ones were like, it's the best book ever written. And, uh, you know, living life by that book will, you know, ensure that th this country continues in the providence of God. These were the unsaved ones saying this. But nobody has any knowledge anymore of the Bible. In the last 50, 60 years, by the way, this has been thrown away. I mean, in the last 50, 60 years of a country who is 230 some years old, we've ruined it in the last 50 years. You know, uh, how many times are you out there explaining who Jesus is to people now? <laughs> you guys are nodding your heads. I mean, you never would have thought of something like that 30 years ago. Now, they're like, you know who Jesus is? No, what? Who? Nobody has any idea. So how will it turn out? Turn to Hosea 4. I know how it's going to turn out. I know how the story ends, and so do you. Why? Because we have the Bible. Amen. Turn to Hosea chapter 4. Look, folks, how do I know it's going to turn out? Because it's the same story over and over and over again. It's the same story. Turn to Hosea chapter 4 and look at verse number 6. And look what the Bible says. Look, at, I mean, this is amazing right here. The Bible says this. I'm going to wait for you all to get there. But this is, as many times as you've read the Old Testament, maybe if you've read it a few times, I know for sure when you read it the first few times or the first couple times, when you read it, you're just like, man, they did it again. You're like, what is wrong with these people? Like, they did it again? What, they forgot God again? They just forgot Him three pages ago. What, what, what's wrong with these morons? I mean, that's how you feel when you read the Old Testament, especially the first couple times. And then you start to realize, oh, it's us. Look at Hosea 4.6. The Bible says, my people are destroyed. Why? It says, I mean, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. Look, that's God talking. That thou shalt be no priest to me. Uh-oh. Seeing that thou hast forgotten the law of God, I will also forget thy children. Look, this will be our downfall right here. You say, what's going to bring this country down? Is it abortion? Is it the, Dem the Democrats? The Democrats are going to bring us down, man. Is it, you know, the abortions of, of you know, 55 million or whatever? I mean, who can even count that high? Or, you know, gun control, is that going to bring us down? No, look, these are all effects. These are all effects. Let's go back to third grade for a moment. Okay, you remember cause and effect? Remember cause and effect sentences? I'm going to read you a couple real simple ones. Look, John failed the test because he did not study. I've actually used this on a couple of you. You know if you fail a test, you know why? Because you didn't study. You know how I know that? Because you failed. 
But that's not the point, okay? The point is, John failed the test because he did not study. So the effect is that John failed the test. The cause was that he did not study. Here's another one. Because Jenny hates liver, she never eats it. Okay? So look, the effect is what? She never, Jenny never eats liver. Why? Because she does not like it. Okay? So look, they point out words like because. You should look for words like because. Right? Go back to Hosea chapter 4 and verse number 6. So, you know, the public school will teach you, hey, look for words like because. They won't tell you, hey, think. Hey, use your brain. Use your brain. Is there a cause and an effect here? They'll say, look for words like because. So let's look in the Bible at words like because. Look at Hosea chapter 4 and verse number 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge. The cause brings about the effect. The cause is lack of knowledge. We forgot the law. The effect, our people are destroyed. And look, you forget the law, the cause is you forgot the law. The effect is God forgets you. Whoa! So if we forget the law in this country, which we've forgotten, God will forget us. Amen. That is what's going to happen. All the other things are effects. They're just effects. I mean, you forget my law and I'll forget you? That sounds judgmental. I mean, that sounds judgmental. I mean, it should because that is judgment. I mean, that's a decision that someone made. That's a decision that said, look, because look, look, if you forget the law, if I give you a law, I give you direction, and you just don't take that direction, I have some choices available to me. I can do nothing. I can not, I mean, say we're at work, and I tell you to do something, you don't do it. I could do nothing. I could just ignore it, right? I mean, that's an option. I'm the boss. I can do whatever I want. I could not pay you. I could fire you. I mean, lots of options, right? Or I could destroy you. I mean, I, I couldn't as your boss, but I mean, God can destroy you. I mean, as far as the spectrum goes of what God can do, I would say destroying you and forgetting you is like the, the, the far end of the spectrum. That's where we're at. And they're just effects for forgetting the law. We're seeing it happen, right? We should notice these things, right? We should notice the, the, the gun control and the control of the government. We should notice the slaughtering of unborn children. We should notice these things. We should judge against these things. We should speak against these things. We should preach against these things. We should try to get people saved and change their mind in this spiritual war. That's what we're supposed to do. We're kings and priests. We're supposed to do this. We're supposed to judge righteous judgment, to discern good and evil. But in order to do that, you need to know what the Bible says. Period. You need it for judgment, for proper judgment. You need it for humility. And you know what? Maybe, most importantly, you need it for the next generation. If they are to have a fighting chance in this mess, because it will be worse for them, because we're fighting, we're fighting, but we're losing. According to the numbers, we're not winning. You should know that, soul winner. But we stay, we keep fighting, it's our job, it's what we are put here to do no matter what, no matter what the numbers say, no matter what the polls say, we go. We have some charts in the back. I don't know if you've seen them. Take one. That chart will show you how you can read through the, you know most people have never read through the whole Bible? Yeah. Most saved Christians don't read the Bible, much less read through the whole Bible. But if you take those charts and you read what? Not once a month, not once a week, you will notice that that chart is a daily chart. And if you follow that chart, you will read the Bible through cover to cover in one year. 
Don't worry about being behind, just start on the date that you're on. And by you know, August 16th of next year, you will have read the whole Bible. If you are a saved Christian and you've not read the whole Bible, you need to make that a goal. Amen. Because it is, you say why? Because you will forget the law. Amen. Look, you will forget it, I'm telling you. You will forget it. Because there is a constant pressure to fill you with other things and to take over your heart and to, to direct you to other things that are of this world, to choke you out with thorns of this world. And if you do not read the law, you will, for, you will forget it. You will forget it. Look, I read through chapters in the Bible that I haven't read for a while, and I'm like, I have forgotten that. You say, you, yeah, me. Look, I don't read every chapter of the Bible every day. When you, when you don't read it, it's not only that you will just forget what it says, there is this huge pressure that will make you forget it faster. And God forbid that your heart gets turned against it. Because then you're in trouble. So listen, folks. You are kings and priests. You must read the Bible. You must read the Bible or you will forget the law. And if you forget the law, you know, as, as a nation, we have forgotten the law and God says, I will forget you. Read the Bible every day. It's super important. Take a chart. Take it home with you. Look, we have this, we have this Bible. I've read books from like the 1800s, 1700s that having a Bible was like people sold like half their goods to get a Bible. They're like, they're like my dad, this one story was like my dad sold our only cow to get a Bible. They had one cow and he sold the cow to get a Bible. I mean, we, I mean, a Bible is, they're, they're everywhere now, so we take them for granted, see? Don't forget the law. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.